Hi, everyone. It's Raghu, and I'm back with another Ramdas here and now. And before we get into introducing the talk uh, from Ramdas, which is from uh, 1993, I just want to give you a couple of heads up out there. One of them is around this fantastic resource that we're going to make available, and it'll be available by the time this podcast comes out, which is, I believe, early March 2020. And it's a meditation power page. And what that means is it's just chock full of different resources on meditation from Ramdas, from articles to, of course, uh, guided meditations and so on. And um, oh, so go if you're not on Ramdas.org mailing list, go do that because then you'll get an email saying it's available. Uh, it's it, it is a fantastic resource. And uh, really happy that we, because we've been asked a lot by different people, either writing in or th retreats. Gee, can you make, you know, Ramdas has done so many kind of different meditations. Well, Ramdas has immersed himself over the years in so many traditions, spiritual traditions. And so there's great stuff, uh, guided meditations from the Theravadan tradition, from the Hindu tradition, from Sufi tradition. I don't know if there's Sufi. See, you just say things. I don't even know. Uh, but there's a lot of different traditions that are represented here. Um, so, and, and a lot of uh, contextualization by Ramdas through some articles that are put out about w the efficacy of meditation and so on. So, all right, to just make sure. And it'll, it'll pop up when you go to ramdas.org. It'll be in a banner as well, I am sure. But do sign up. Um, the other thing is, I wanted to mention this particular podcast that I did on mind rolling, and mind rolling is the podcast that I do aside from the introduction of Ramdas through Ramdas and here, here and now. And um, so this one's called uh, from Joseph and I and my son Noah is involved. Tell you that story. It's called Uncovering Afflictive Emotions. It's just fantastic. And out of the three of them that uh, Sharon. Salzburg and Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield, who brought insight meditation basically back to the West, uh, certainly to the United States. Uh, Joseph just has a certain clarity that I find uh, just so refreshing, and uh, he, he just makes things very easy to understand, especially from the uh, the mindfulness tradition. And he wrote this great book called Mindfulness that uh, I would suggest anybody pick up. And uh, so Noah has said to me, you know, I've been listening because I've been working on Joseph's podcast and I'm listening and I'm really, hey, is there any way, he says, is there any way that we can do a podcast with Joseph that I could be included? And of course, Joseph being who he is said, of course. And um, so there we were. And uh, of course, it wasn't that long after Ram Dass had left. So Joseph, uh, Noah prompted him about that. And Joseph talked uh, fairly extensively about loss and about um, grief and uh, not conflating the two. It's, it's really, uh, really an amazing thing. And then also Noah wants to talk to him about anxiety and he talked about his own going through fear stuff in his life and how he dealt with it. Just, uh, I, I can't more highly recommend a podcast that can help really... Uh, I always call it on mind rolling, regaining a life in balance. So certainly can do that. Okay, on to the, um, oh, well, let me just say one other thing. There's still space open, by the way, for Ramdas, uh, the uh, spring retreat in Maui. We're obviously Ramdas, he will be with us there. I am sure of that through all of us. But we're also going to introduce some uh, media of his and and uh, contextualize around and talk about it. We have Robert Thurman. We have uh, Anne Lamott. We have Roshi Joan Halifax, Frank Ostaseski, and, of course, Christian Das on the day-to-day. -day, and myself will be there. And, uh, and we'll have yoga with Saraswati. So... Um, yeah, so there's still space available there. And also at the Ojai Immersion Retreat, where we're going to have Mirabai Star and um, Govindas from Bhakti Yoga Shala in L.A. and myself and Saraswati and some other people. 
like East Forest is going to make an appearance and some guests. Uh, that's May 21 through 24. So just that little commercial there, people, you can still join. Um, it's this uh, talk that I'm introducing from Ram Dass is, again, from 1993. And uh, it's called In Between Stories. And he tells this great story, which he, he told, he's told a number of times from Milton Friedman, not the economist, apparently. And it's this, it's, I'm not going to tell the story because if people, if I tip off anything, I get letters. Don't do that. Just get to the thing. Uh, okay. So I'm not, it's a fabulous story that, that is the deep connector and rudder for this whole talk, right? And the talk is around um, basically... He says, we're in trouble because we're in between stories. And by the way, this is a good thing. Uh, people can write back to me uh, and just give their impression of why and how are we in between stories and what that really means. Once you listen to this talk, you'll get it. Uh, but it, it's, it's regarding basically the em emptiness of the institutions, particularly religious institutions. And uh, the... You know what we think is uh, what we is is the way we know how to play the game, right? You know, in the world, it's a it's a fear-driven social structure, and and I love how he talks here about the '60s, where he says we touch the sense of a love-driven social structure, and boy, everyone's put that down, eh? Over the years, like naive, naive. Yes, it was naive. There was naivete there. But we learned about the power of the human heart at that time, and that's still so evident today. Right? Uh, and I, he says, our hearts are the most intimate doorway to the heart of the divine. So um, the core of this is, is this, the, the myths and the stories that we are living with now are just this old patri patriarchal, model that has crept into, of course, all of our institutions. And um, so the myths that we live with in order to be effective players in our world are old, we're in between, I think that's what he means. We're, we're in between because these old myths aren't, aren't doing it doing us any good and they're creating this gigantic polarization and yet we haven't come to the place where uh where we realize that our hearts are, are the most intimate doorway into our connectivity you know what can we get now and and i think this is crucial for all of us that are doing that are walking the spiritual path what we what can we get from our spiritual work that allows for social structures that are compassionate that are just so how do we, we, we're turning ourselves around. How do we turn our, ourselves around to the point where uh, there's the dream that we can hear each other and celebrate ethnic diversity you know, instead of being threatened by it? A dream that we can walk lightly on the earth. These are Ram Dass's words. A dreams that we can just hear each other. Right? And uh, that's, uh, people say, well, what are we here for? That is what we're here for. Right. And um, towards the end of this talk, he, he, um, he talks to a rabbi, I think it was Shlomo Karlbach, one of the two, I can forget the other one. Um, and he says, what would you tell as a, as a, as a, a Jew and in, in your, let's say you're in Israel, what would you tell the Arabs? What would the Arabs tell you? And he's, well, first he said, Oibe, I thought that was uh, apt. Um, but basically he said, before we can hear one another, we have to be able to hear, grieve with each other. I just thought that was such a fantastic uh, statement, right? Before we can hear each other, we've got to grieve with each other, hear another. We got to grieve with each other. Just think of what's going on now in this country and this year with this election coming up. 
and the antipathy that we have to the other side. Just think of that. How, you know, and then you start to think, okay, and, and in this case, we're not talking about, I mean, obviously with, with Israelis and Arabs, there's a grieving over lives being lost. And there is lives being lost here through uh, policies, perhaps, and uh, through intractability and so on. And you can hear in my voice, you know, how um, the creation of separation by virtue of my own belief systems about the other side. How can we get to a place, and we're not talking about grieving together, but hear, hearing each other, uh, hearing each other's pain in, in any way. And I'm talking about stuff that I'm not, I'm not really able to fully embody. And, and that's why this talk from Ram Dass is really uh, quite fantastic, actually, and so apt for these times, if we could really listen to it. And I suppose one of the takeaways is uh, certainly that we need to start creating a story that is inclusive that is not polarizing, which the stories that we've lived with for a very long time, and probably I'm talking you know, centuries, um, the patriarchal overseeing of our institutions and the way in which, uh, and as you'll hear when you hear this story from Milton Friedman, uh, the, the, we've gotten so far away from thinking about each other and what we what the other needs rather than what we need so great great talk ramdas so went march 1993 and uh, happy to be here with everybody it's been quite a couple of months and uh, we're all going to we're going to make it together because we're going to meet together we're going to hang together. We're going to love, serve, remember. Is going to create more and more opportunities as much as we can to have get community together because in that way we can support each other to cut through a lot of this uh, separation that we see. This is uh, Ram Das here and now on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and catch a bunch of really fantastic teachers and thought leaders and. Uh, we shall see you next week. Ram Ram. I've been learning that stories are such a profound way to transmit a teaching, to share a quality of wisdom with other human beings. And I don't, I'm not under an illusion that I have a, either a corner on the market of wisdom or even any special wisdom. I feel you and I are all the we are being born into wisdom and we come together to share what we're hearing so and figure out how to live our lives out of that place of wisdom it's like the culture is graduating from knowledge to wisdom and wisdom has to do with the intuitive heart and the way we receive information and i've been enjoying using stories as well and um, this story, which I've told many times, concerns somebody, and you, many of you have heard this story, um, concerns a man named Milton Friedman, who many of you know. And um, Milton um, was a speechwriter in the White House. It's not the Milton Friedman, the economist, but he has a PhD, too. So one day he received a telephone call and said, is this Dr. Milton Friedman? And he said, yes. And the caller said, this is a, um, this is a large church. I'm calling from the board of a large church on the West Coast. And we have a lot of excess funds and we wonder if you could suggest how we might invest them. So Milton said, have you considered giving them to the poor? <laughs> to which the caller said, is this the real Milton Friedman? <laughs> to which Milton Friedman answered, is this the real church?
Um, in the interview with the Bill Moyers and uh, Joseph Campbell, one point, one of them said, um, a quote gave a quote from Barry, a poet, and I assumed it was Wendell Barry, but it said, I think it said Thomas Barry, Tom Barry, who's another wonderful being, whichever Barry it was, it says, we are in trouble because we are in between stories. That just as you could hear in the, in the Milton Friedman story, an image of social institutions that's really dysfunctional. I mean, a religious institution that presumably serves as an intermediary before the, between the individual heart and God. But what has awakened many of us in this room is the realization that our hearts are the most intimate doorway to our experience of God. And that the churches often lost their power because people came to them continually to get their door open to their inner spirit. They came to get something from the church. And when you have an institution in which everybody comes and takes something, pretty soon it doesn't have anything. And since the human spirit comes uniquely through the human heart into these kind of institutions, I mean, trees have it directly, but these other institutions get it indirectly. As you and I know and taste that spirit in ourselves, we come to a church in order to celebrate the rituals of remembering God. And we bring and we invest in the process. And we take an institution that's been functioning in a kind of a deadened way, caught in symbol and ritual without like shopping lists. Like you go into a church, people are saying, holy, holy, holy. And you look around, you look at their faces and they're all like righteous and tight and you know, they're being good. And they're thinking of something else. And you take those words, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Oh, God. Ooh. And you come in and you start to invest them. And the whole thing starts to turn into something else. And you and I recognize that the, the power of the human heart as a social institution. Like in the anti-Vietnam movement, there was a dissonance between the truth, the moral, the ethical, the compassionate wisdom of the human heart and the nation state of which we were members its stance and justification for the killing of the Vietnam War. And because something had happened in the 60s, whatever that was, the vertical patriarchal institutions were seen as paper tigers compared to the power of the human heart. And when, as I've talked about, everybody surrounded the the Pentagon, or the people that did, and held hands and ohmed so the Pentagon would rise. Only a few people saw it rise, actually. <laughs> but just the act said something about the Pentagon. It made it into one of these incredible, fantastic dream creations. A phantom, a dream, a bubble. And that empowerment seen in in civil rights, in sexual freedom, in women's rights, in gay, lesbian, in environmental, in da, 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 da. When I got thrown out of Harvard for my research with Tim Leary with drugs, I remember a press conference in which um, all the press had come, because I was the first professor thrown out of Harvard in the 20th century. <laughs> and. No, I mean, 
Harvard is a very good institution. It's, I mean, it's, what it does, it does very well. What it doesn't do was what we were pointing out. <laughs> but it didn't want to know what it didn't do. It only wanted to know what it did do. And it was a temple to the rational mind, and we came in with the meta-rational or the irrational, which saw the rational mind as a subsystem, and you don't walk up to the priest class and say, you're, you know, you're a minor church. <laughs> we, let's, we, like, we came onto a tennis court with football cleats, you know, I mean, it was like... <laughs> Hey, man, go out of your mind. What do you mean, go out of my mind? My business is based on being in my mind. <clears throat> but it's clear to us now in terms of myths. We used, to think, we used to think that what we thought was the best way to play the game. The thinking mind and then science, which is its child, and then technology, which is its child, would take and reorganize everything in such a way that we would be happy, free of suffering, joyful, peaceful. Are you? Are you? Did it work? See, I would say that in, if you look at the world at this moment, it's really hard not to see a fear-driven social structure. And yet what we touched, certainly in the 60s, was a sense of a love-driven, if you will, social structure. But what happened in the 60s, we, we were very naive. And we assumed that once we saw this incredible power of love, which had to do with egalitarian and compassionate human relationships and kind of the the unity of boundarylessness of the where we lived in and feeling ourselves at home in a community of spirit, of relation to the environment, in a biotic communities, in family communities, in nation state communities and so on. We tasted that and we felt so, it, its inherent power so strongly, we just assumed everything would fall before it. And the minstrels, the Bob Dylans, and the Jefferson Airplane, and the Grateful Dead, and the Rolling Stones, and on and on. They carried the message. So suddenly, 10 and 12 and 14-year-olds were sitting with their earphones on, listening to the words coming out of people who were playing with planes of consciousness. And the minute you start to have the perspective of playing simultaneously with more than one plane of consciousness... You are free of the oppressive power of any institution on any one plane. In other words, the Pentagon is relatively real rather than absolutely real. Is this too weird or are you with me? Okay. I mean, I just figure what the hell and then I never know whether I lost everybody. See, because I've taken a lot of drugs and um, so... As I said the other day in the workshop, I may well be psychotic, <laughs> see? but I always want to pay a point out, you paid to hear me, I see, in terms of I mean, like, well, who's got the problem after all? <laughs> but what in fact happened in the 60s was that the people that hadn't been touched by that direct experience of unity, of interdependency, and who were stuck in their separateness and thus frightened, and therefore were collecting power and material power and worldly power in order to fend off the anxiety generated by their fear and ultimately to fend off death. And those people looked around and they saw an emerging consciousness that undercut the social institutions that empowered them. And they got frightened. And what fear leads to is fanaticism, where you can't hear anybody else, you get caught in a belief system, and ultimately violence. 
And you can see the fear-driven nature of the violence in the Middle East in Bosnia, Herzegovina, etc. And that gave rise to fundamentalism in this country, to conservatism. And you could see the pendulum swing. And that the 60s had really given the juice because they represented the potential of anarchy or chaos. And the human psyche, unless it is evolved to be resting simultaneously in the plane of emptiness, where there is no time and there's no space and nothing's coming and nothing's going, or resting in the realm of pure awareness. Chaos and anarchy are very scary because in chaos and anarchy, the worst that could happen is you could die. And if you're a philosophical materialist, that's a drag. <laughs> if you're a mystic, it's just very interesting. <laughs> if you're a high enough mystic, it's just another moment. So in a way, uh, that's why I too, as um, Stephen mentioned yesterday in his opening remarks, you know, had a difficult time with the word revolution, even though Mira and Joan had presented the way of revolution thinking of the turning of the wheel. And if I can see it as the turning of the wheel from cynicism to hope, it's a kind of fun thing to play with. Because I've always pitted revolution, which is something against something, to evolution, which is something which evolves into something. And it, and it embraces everything into itself as it evolves. But I could see it as revolution from the unconscious into the conscious. And as far as the word hope, I have really lived for the number of years now with Trungpa Rinpoche's teaching, which he said, you have to stand halfway between hope and hopelessness. See, I'm talking now to you about what myths you and I have to live with in order to be effective players in the game. What, what can we get from our spiritual work all these years, our inner work, our development work, our personality work? What can we get now that as we hear, once again, as we heard in the 60s, a kind of a liquid possibility that the kind of dream or vision we've, we have deep in our being, that there can be social structures that are compassionate. There can be social structures which are just, where there is real equity. Dreams that we can hear each other and celebrate ethnic diversity instead of being threatened by it. Dreams that we can walk lightly on the earth. Dreams that we can just hear each other. The dream that the participant in the social structure can have a balance within their being between their preoccupation with their own individuality and their membership in the community that is concerned with the common good. Common good of the earth and species, common good of species with each other and with themselves. In the 60s, the major source of that awakening, that ability, I'd say my audiences, and I was already old then, my audiences were, but my audiences were between about 15 and 25 years old. Because they were, because of the affluence from the post-Second World War, they were free enough of the pressure of having to, quote, work to survive, that their consciousnesses were loose enough to be able to absorb these altered states of consciousness and start to work with integrating the many planes of consciousness simultaneously. And because they were not seeded into the social culture and they tasted that quality of love and unity and we're all one, it's the Haight-Ashbury love, summer of love type thing. 
It's the sticking the flower into the gun, however horrible that side effect of that was, but still that act, that image. But what happened was, and I was part of that, we set up alternative culture. We set up communes. We set up bartering systems. The farm, Steve Gaskins, the, the acid tests. I mean, instead of saying we'll play within the system, if the system gets too scared, well, bye-bye system. We'll go off and play on our own. But you see, now in the 90s, the game is different. The baby boomers will be 50 in 1996. We are no longer outside the establishment. There's no them. We're it. Now we've got a problem. <laughs> See? Because now you can't say those old farts did it to us. I'm going to sit back and watch. See, now I look at Hillary and the boys. And... <laughs> And I see, I mean, maybe it's not Kennedy. I mean, maybe Bill Clinton isn't screwing in every closet in the White House. And he was still good. That's a hard one for us righteous people to hear. Can you screw in the closet and still be a compassionate president? Are we ready for that? Nope. <laughs> nope. Damn it, nope. <laughs> I don't know. Tantra works in interesting ways. I think we'd rather be righteous than happy, it turns out, in this culture. It's a real drag. We're still functioning under a kind of a Freudian model that if you don't live in oughts and shoulds, you're going to be reduced to your id, which is amoral. See? And then Jung comes along and says, oh, Freud, are you hung up. Why do you stay in the second chakra and make everything reductionistic to that? Come on up to the fourth chakra. It's much more fun. <laughs> and then that suggests that behind all of this psychosocial crap, here we are. And if I am really open and really don't define boundaries as myself, but just allow my awareness to expand, what stops it often is my fear of your suffering. That if I open to your suffering, I'll be destroyed. And the answer is you will be. Because your suffering plus my suffering is unbearable. If I'm going to try to contain it within me. Like 45 to 60,000 people died, will die today of malnutrition. And the world spends $1 trillion a year on military weaponry. It's $2 million a minute. One week of that military hardware would cover all 15 million of those people that are going to die this year, so they wouldn't need to die. Now, if you just assume that's a, state, that's a, that's a photograph of who we are as humans. Look at how out of proportion our fear of our own death is that we are willing to starve to death 15 million of us every year in order to get this inordinate thing to protect us from dying, basically. The predicament is you take a myth like that and you pit it against what you have experienced. I mean, when I've had the good fortune with Mira to go to Guatemala as part of the SEVA project and come to a village that has nothing, nothing, not even a hoe to scratch the seed and meet a woman who's holding her child that's undernourished 
and look into her eyes, she just isn't them. <laughs> She's, are you in there? I'm in here. Wow. It's a far out trip you're having, isn't it? Yeah. And suddenly, the way in which she and I are us, in which we are living with these different storylines, because a Mayan woman is right there, because she has a cultural support system for not losing that plane of consciousness. It's like in the holy book of the Mayans. It says, when we're walking along and one of us falls, we help that person up and then everybody walks just a little bit slower. Now, how alien that myth is from the myth of what's in it for me. And that if every individual takes care of themselves, we'll all win. I think that Bill and Hillary and Al and Tipper, Tipper I'm not sure about yet, but, but the other three, I think they are basically decent, good, and very intelligent people. And out of their mouths are coming things that are amazingly compassionate and wise. And I have no idea where those things are coming from. I mean, I saw an interview with George Stephanopoulos on, on Charlie Rose's show. Beautiful interview. Stephanopoulos, who comes out of a family of priests. Charlie said to him, what's your worst fear? He said that we as a government could not be worthy of the trust of the people. That's far out, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine somebody's making an overture to you to trust them? Now, the interesting question to me about all this is if I can feel the breath of the possibility of change. Now, I'm not naive. I understand the change is all there is. Okay. I mean, I really bought the, the Buddha's truths and so on. So it's all changing. So I'm sure in every age of history, say, this is the moment of change. You know, where we just flew. Wow. And it was. And there have been again and again. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I remember. I mean, I really felt, wow, is this a moment of history? And it was. So every moment is the moment. C.S. Lewis says you don't see the center because it's all center, which is a very empowering thought. Isn't it? Because you see that if it's all center, wherever you are is it. And when you have gone into the planes of consciousness where you see the interweaving net of who we all are, and you understand the information age and how it's working, you see that you don't have to go to the center of power and be claimed the person of power. You just have to send your light out as purely as you can in the way you live your life, in the supermarket, in the store, with your child, with whatever. And that is part of the, the, the total web of the League of Compassion or that quality, that force. Like the interesting thing about the Freudian Jungian business is the question is, at your source, are you good? Would you do good? Or would you not care? And the answer is both. You would do good and you would not care. You would do good because you are good. You are good because you see the nature of Dharma. You have entered into the place where you see there's only us. In fact, if you go a little further on the mystical ladder, you see there's only me or I or one. And then once you're in that, it's all empty. So then you it's like a Buddhist, Christian, Taoist, you know. As I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buju Hindu. So you can, for a long time, milk the thought like we're all one, but it's my television set. <laughs> yeah. 
See, but ultimately, you've got to realize that if my happiness is based on denying your pain, I'm standing on tiptoe. And it's, there's fear in it. There is fear in it. I mean, going from Guatemala in a village where the people are frightened that the military that is in, in the service of the wealthy small percent are going to come in and murder them. And then flying to Hollywood, where I had a gig, and going down a street in Brentwood, where there are no people, there are just walls and video cameras, and signs on the lawns that the security company has put there that says, armed response. And in three and a half hours, I'm in a place where the rich are cowering behind their walls, afraid of the poor. What does it say? Ten minutes. Okay. I'll start to weave all this psychosis together. <laughs> and the, 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 the dysfunctional myth is the idea that you can buy privacy that will allow you to be happy through denial that you can live in a middle-class ghetto where you can have a token poor person or a couple of them and forget the inner cities for a while. But the emerging myths have got to be in harmony with our deepest intuitive truth. And the intuitive truth is there's no, the information age has made a lot of our myths dysfunctional. And the, real, the only real myth is we are part of community. We are part of biotic, social, political, economic community. It is only us. It is only us. There's no them. And if you don't, if you try to hold on to a them, you close your heart. You armor your heart. And if you do that, you, you turn off the channel to experiencing the grace. If I sit with somebody that is very ill and going through pain and suffering through AIDS or cancer or because while Stephen is Mr. Death, Stephen and Andrea, Mr. and Mrs. Death, I am um, Mr. Death Jr. Okay. So people call me when they're dying, which is a great thing, you know, would you come? We're dying. So I come in, see, and I'm like, I'm here. You know, I, I, you never know, are you an undertaker or a priest or, you know, like what role should you fit into? Got this great image of being called on Christmas Day to a woman who was dying of cancer of the brain. She was 38. She had four children. She was a brilliant lawyer. And I arrived and her family were all downstairs and they, like, you've come, like the Messiah. I don't even, I've been on the freeway for an hour and they got my coat off and she's waiting and I'm walking to this darkened room with this body on the bed and I go and sit down and take her hand <sighs> see and I start my I'm Mr. Death I've come here to help you you know to do my number I'm a helper and after I've been busy helping her I look into her eyes fine I quiet down enough off the freeway and she's just there waiting for me to finish my bullshit. <laughs> I mean, another teacher who's come to bless me. And the great joy of the heart is you realize that once you're willing to let go of the myth of the dominance of individuality and tune to the myth of community, you start to receive the grace of feeling fed by the way you live your life. I mean, people at work that go and serve, as Joan was telling that story yesterday, go serve in a soup kitchen. You're depressed, go help somebody. Instead of pushing away their pain, open to it. Oh, my heart will break. Sure, let it break again and again and again, and then see what's left. The point is that you and I have cultivated certain awareness. We have a certain ability to hold more than one plane consciously. We can hold, we may not have integrated them fully. Like I know that there is incredible pollution and that a tremendous amount of that pollution is caused by automobiles. 
and that the wisest person is the one that would either walk, bicycle, or if necessary, and then use the public transportation next, and then after that would have a, a an electric car, or then would have a, a low gas, a high gas consumption, a high efficiency car. But it turned out that when my stepmother was dying, the thing she treasured in her world was her old Mercedes Benz. And she gave it to me. So I'm sitting with this car that roughly it's all rusted and stuff, but it's really beautiful and it drives lovely. And it gets about 12 to 13 miles to a gallon. Now, I am therefore a pollutant in a system where I understand that pollution is a total drag. How do I integrate that? Sell the car? Yeah. Sentimental? Hold it? Who knows? If I sell it, somebody else will get it. I'm just playing with the issues that I, I play with. Because even though we haven't integrated them, we are aware of these various planes of consciousness. That the universe is a dream, and it's also real. And what at this moment, when we feel the potential of change and we see that we are part of the social institutions, we can change all of it from within because of the web of communication and the information age. And we, in a sense, you take somebody like Clinton who may be good and caring and decent. We don't, I don't trust how awake he is. I don't know. I mean, he likes Paul McCartney more than John Lennon. How could he be awake? You know, things like that. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, who knows? That's all Meshuggah stuff. He may be surrounded with people like George Stephanopoulos. I mean, maybe there are some wise people. Maybe I don't know how it's all there. But I would like to be a support system for him to, to help him, a satsang, a sangha, to help him keep rooted in the deeper planes out of which compassion, equanimity, spaciousness, allowing the alternatives to happen, happen. Okay? And that's our responsibility. <laughs> that's what we are about. It is not just that we do something, it's how we do something. And which we do is dependent in each of you on what your unique predicament is. So, like, I don't know at this moment whether I am sitting at the bedside of the birth of another level of human consciousness that puts the whole thing into perspective. Are we about to go from the Kali Yuga into the Sat Yuga? Or, that's one choice, or are we about to go into the Pralaya before the Sat Yuga? Are we about to go into the dissolution of all the forms back into Shiva's head? as he gets up and stretches and dances before he sits down and creates the universe all over again. In other words, am I sitting at the bedside of a dying or a being born? Or is the world of or just another plane of reality? And behind it all, birth and death are the same thing. And what I'm sitting at is the edge of the mystery. And the interesting question you and I can look at is how do you deal with mystery? How do you deal with the unknown? How do you deal with it? Well, the answer is, I don't know. But I don't know doesn't have to be, oh my God, I don't know. In other words, can you live now rooted enough in other planes of awareness so that you can sit with the uncertainty of not knowing how all this comes out and not be immobilized by that uncertainty? Can you sit with it in such a way that you are doing what you do because it's in these, you call your dharma, without an attachment to how it comes out? I will still, whether it's going to end or begin, the best thing I can still do is quiet my mind so I can hear. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing, the Tao says. I can open my heart so I can be part of the liquidity of the universe, like a tree is or like a river is. I can take my place in it without the mediation of my self-conscious mind. Well, now I'm being a tree. I can balance discriminative wisdom or that part that uses the judging mind with a appreciation, with gratitude, with appreciation for the awesome nature of the mystery of suffering and death.
I saw an interview with Dan Rather with Clinton the other night. Dan Rather says, do you, do you spend much time quietly just uh, reflecting about all this? He said, well, I really, uh, I'd like to more, but I, I've been really trying to catch up on the paperwork. And I want to say to him, Bill, watch out. That's what happened to you know, our last Democratic president. Too much paperwork. Too little trust in wisdom and too much expectation about knowledge. That it takes discipline to empty the mind to hear the answer, as opposed to fill the mind with more facts. Not that you don't use the facts and delight in them and play with them, but don't make them your deity. Don't worship the rational mind. See it as a beautiful instrument and a lousy master. The opportunity you and I have is to listen, is to open our hearts to grieving with each other. When I asked Zalman Shachter, the rabbi, if you were an Israeli, what would you say to an Arab? And he said, Oy, Gavald. He said, you know, before we can hear each other, we have to be able to grieve with one another. That until the Arab feels heard by the Jew and the Jew feels heard by the Arab, heard in their pain, they cannot meet as children of the same father. And for you to hear your enemy's pain requires a quality of compassion and a quality of fearlessness and a quality of willingness to allow your heart to be broken again and again. But behind the breaking heart, yesterday in the bicycle man story, After the bicycle man was told that the hat made of Weepil pieces that he was wearing, that he had found along the way, and that the reason there was that particular odor was because this part had been part of a woman's bodice and therefore it had breast milk in it. And what was the hole in the back Well, it was the un that was unraveling of the hat? Well, that was because a bullet had come through and killed the person, so there was blood in the hat. And the bicycle man said, I can't wear this hat. It and he was told, the bicycle man was told, this hat will make you strong. This hat will make you strong. Embracing the beauty of birth, the nature of death, the quality of suffering, being able to look it in the eye and say yes, so that you're not copping out with reactivity into righteousness, into denial, into hysteria, into violence, into, but you stay wide open to what is. You listen, you listen your way into hearing your part in the game, and then you play it with a giggle. Because after all, it's just another mind moment. Thank you very much. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.